Hi, Planet Earth. Uh, note from your editor here. If you are watching this episode before you've seen part one, you didn't see my recap and beginning of the review for it, so click over there and come back when you have watched part one. So Willow and Giles are trying to contain the portal as much as they can, and while they're doing so, the Calamari Glutton and the Siren Mistress escape. And basically, we find out that the only way to close this portal is to close it from the other side, like in the other dimension, because the walls between our realities are so strong. But if somebody goes into the Hell Dimension to close it, they won't be able to come back through because, again, we've made the rules of magic so that it's really almost impossible to open portals between this world and others. And so either this hell world is going to completely destroy ours or somebody can go through but they're going to be totally trapped there. And so we're basically looking at this impossible situation because it's not like we have a way to seal off this portal and it's not like we kind of have a a magical key. But don't we? And everybody's looking at Dawn and she's like, why is everybody looking at me? And that's where we end the issue. Alright, so Dawn is a magical key. We were talking in the comments a couple, I don't know, whatever's ago, about Dawn possibly being some kind of magical key figure, finally. And, um, you know, I don't read ahead, or not read ahead, but I don't look ahead at the covers if I can help it. And so, um, I didn't know what you guys were talking about, but yeah, you're totally right. Dawn's got these, like, magical key powers for some reason. Uh, this has kind of been in the back of our heads, I feel like, since the beginning of Season 10, that maybe these new rules mean a new kind of key thing for Dawn. But my thing is, has this always been the case? Has Dawn always been our way to, like, close off portals because she would have been real handy back in Season 2? Am I wrong? No. All right, so again with this cover, it makes it seem like the Siren Mistress is, like, really the big bad, but... Spike points out that life is the big bad in this particular issue. I have to say, I, I left this issue feeling a little underwhelmed, but at the same time as I was kind of marinating on it as I made my opening credit sequence, and when I made my opening credit sequence, I was like, I never thought in a million years I would be using this TV theme for Dawn, but it's so funny that I get to, and we've kind of had, again, this question about Dawn in the back of our heads all season, like, what is all of this new rule bullshit going to mean for Dawn going forward? Well, it means that she gets to be a key player in the Magical MacGuffin of the week. And really, apart from the Xander and Anya stuff and the fact that Giles has this new girlfriend, that's all I'm really taking away from this, but I feel like that alone is pretty awesome. I mean, it's so much fun to have Dawn be in the mix and be kind of helpless, but also our savior question mark i don't know um it's it's raising a lot of questions for me that i can't even begin to start on uh here you know what i mean and so um all of this is really interesting i like that again we've got dawn in this kind of power play position and all eyes are literally suddenly on her you know i do take issue with the siren mistress and the calamari glutton because they aren't very intimidating like at the end of the day they just I don't know why they picked these guys to be our big bads, because they they just suck. And again, Spike points out that these guys aren't as big and bad as life in this particular season, and it, especially at this point in the season. Um, everybody's really having to deal with just living in this new world that they've all created for themselves. I will say that I don't know how much sense it makes to have Dawn be poison to the soul glutton. You'd think she'd be like the opposite of kryptonite, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know, like crack. But um, I, I don't really understand why that would work that way, but whatever, I like what they're doing with it. So how evil is Dr. Mike, okay? He's basically telling Xander to ignore Anya and maybe she'll learn to go away. And I don't know, this whole Dr. Mike thing just seems super suspect to me. He's like telling Xander to ignore Anya when, when you have a ghost, like what you do with a ghost is you try to figure out what they want because ghosts are lacking closure, right? Like you need to figure out what the ghost wants and then help it move on or move away, like move, right? Like get out of my life. And so with Dr. Mike telling Xander to ignore his ghosts, this is a totally like, oh, 
lovely psychological problem that he presents him with because you don't ignore ghosts, you confront them, you try and communicate with them. So Dr. Mike is totally a bad guy, and if Dr. Mike is not a bad guy, then I'm going to have to figure out how to sue my own brain because it has been telling me something completely else. And again, I like how frustrated uh, Not Ghost Anya is because she, it seems like, didn't choose to exist. And it seems like she is just a victim in all of this as much as Xander himself is. And so she is experiencing this real frustration about not being recognized for being. Like, even if she isn't Anya, it's, it's really kind of cruel of Xander to ignore whatever it is that it is. Something we have not done enough of in season 10, which is I feel like a really, really missed opportunity, is having Buffy be Giles' mom. Um, this was such a neat dynamic that they introduced in season 9 with you know resurrecting Giles and all that fun was that uh, he was looking at Faith and sexualizing her um, and kind of being attracted to her. And we saw immediately that Giles was young and he couldn't help kind of his hormones and things like this, you know what I mean? So um, I I like this exchange between Buffy and Giles because it is kind of like her putting her foot down and kind of putting him in his place. And here she is literally in the power position because she's got the book that, ironically enough, he left her, right? Um, I like this, and I wish that we had had more of Buffy momming Giles throughout season 10. I really do, because because moments like this really work. It creates... Uh, it, it totally flips the Buffy and Giles dynamic on its head. It takes exactly where Giles was through the first three or four seasons and puts Buffy there, and now Giles is the kid who wants to go and play with his girlfriend. I really like this. I, I really admire Kid Giles. You know, I'm a big fan. There's very little of Willow here, but there's also very, very little of Spike. Um, Spike, I don't know why they're kind of not going ahead and hitting us over the head with the fact that we need to talk about these Buffy and Spike issues. Like, we really do need to talk about that. And uh, he really gets the short end of the stick. Like, Andrew gets more to do here than uh, Spike does. So that's all well and good. And I like that uh, Spike did get to say hell no when everybody was saying no about Dawn, you know. And I really like that we finally have an issue where they don't make an issue out of Andrew being gay. Pretty much as soon as he came out, it's been all about, oh, making gay references to Andrew in every issue. But here, nope, he's just Andrew. He's just being here with us to kind of handle things. And I really like that. I appreciate that from the writers. It's not all about, like, Willow being gay, and it's not all about Andrew being gay. They just happen to be so. And so I do appreciate that Buffy. And I don't know, I'm just actually kind of, like, super excited and giddy about this whole, like, Dawn possibilities opening up to us. And, you know, the thing about it is, as I'm always talking about Dawn, is having all these possibilities. And, like, literally, like, all the possibilities. I was, I remember I was looking at the cover, and I was thinking, you know, like, why is Dawn here? Like, why have they got Dawn, like, all up in the mix on this cover? It's not like she's really going to be able to do anything. And they totally went and proved me wrong in number 24, so thank you. I have to say, Spuffies, I was really surprised in my viewer feedback episode that you guys were all like, yeah, let Buffy cheat on Spike. Cheat on that motherfucker. Get her some self-respect and all this good stuff. And I was just like, oh, like, who are you people? Like, the Spuffies are usually like, Rrr. no offense. But yeah, it seems like you guys really do want to see Buffy go out there and cheat on Spike. And I was just super surprised by that. But that's pretty much all I've got for today, you guys. I hope you're having a great 2016 so far, everybody. You can come right back here to the Buffington Post anytime for Buffy the Vampire Slayer reviews, Angel and Faith reviews, Buffy vs. Discussions, Discussions on the Other Slayers, Season 8, Season 9. I will be continuing my Season 9 coverage tomorrow with a pretty damn perfect issue of Angel and Faith. It's uh, Season 9, number 16. So have a great day today, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Ancient gods, warlords, and kings. A land in turmoil cried out for a hero. She was Xena, a mighty princess forged in the heat of battle. Her courage will change the 
world. But that's pretty much all I've got for today, you guys. I hope you are having a great 2015 so far. <laughs> okay. My B F F Joe 730.